Hello, you legendary people. Welcome to or welcome back to Lauren's Legends. This is the first story that while researching, I had to stop and step away before coming back to finish. Of all American serial killers, Israel Keyes stands alone in his own category of one of the most ambitious and terrifying of all time. It is quite strange to me that this case is not much more widely known. You will definitely need to stay to the end of this one to find out how this monster got caught. Please be aware this video comes with a big warning. We will be covering about everything that is bad, including animal harm. Feel free to turn back now if that is something that you cannot watch. So turn a light on and sit back because I am going to tell you all about what makes him the most diabolical. There is a common question about most serial killers out there, and that is, of course, how did they become this way? Normally, there are several things in their childhood that are red flags, and Israel had all of them. Israel was born on January 7th, 1978 in Cove, Utah. He was the second of 10 children, and his family was extremely religious. When he was later being interviewed by the police, he stated that when he was around three or four, his family picked up and moved to a very remote part of Washington state and Israel and his siblings were homeschooled for seven years. His entire family lived in a tiny cabin that was completely off the grid. No phones, no electricity, no running water to make matters worse for this growing boy. The family attended a local church that was rumored to preach white supremacy and anti-Semitism gospel. Later on, two guys that were a little older that attended that church were arrested for several hate crimes and killings in the area, including offing a local family of three. Police believe that being around them as a child might have helped motivate his own urges. Israel himself would later state that he could remember back to when he was 12, having a huge interest in that church and their hate filled sermons. It is reported that he began showing the first signs of psychopathy around this time in his childhood. These signs were breaking into his neighbor's homes and stealing their guns. And as several of us true crime buffs out there are well aware of, this is a huge red flag coming up. Before long, his twisted hobbies escalated into torturing and shooting animals, including a cat. He tied the poor baby to a tree before wounding it with a 22 revolver. More sadistic acts would soon follow. Israel would later admit to gutting a deer while it was still alive. He also admitted to setting many fires. Israel knew that there was something very different about him. He knew that he delighted in things that made others shudder in disgust, and he decided to lean into it even more. When he was older, he joined the army in 1998. He excelled in the army. All the years living off the grid had made this the perfect job for him. He was later discharged in 2001 and moved to Washington state and this is where his killings began. After some time in Washington state, he then moved to Anchorage, Alaska in 2007, and he decided to start a construction business using the handy skills he had developed as a child. During this time, he had a daughter that he surprisingly doted on, but Israel would take trips away from Anchorage and would leave his family behind. He would use work or visits to relatives as an excuse to travel so much, but what he was really doing was offing people throughout Washington, Vermont, and several other states. The FBI actually has a timeline showing Israel took about 36 trips between 2004 and 2012. His trips spanned over the entire country, even including Hawaii 
and Canada, and he went to Mexico. Israel would later confess to murdering 11 people across the United States between 2001 and 2012, but only three of his victims have ever been identified. The FBI is convinced that there could be many, many more that have never been found. When Israel Keyes was eventually caught, he became an open book and was eerily very forthcoming to the authorities, like he was proud and the following information is what came from hours of these interview tapes. Even among the top criminal profilers with the FBI Behavior Analysis Unit were terrified and bewildered by him because of his modus operandi was totally unprecedented. Israel would confess he committed his first crime way back when he was a teenager at a camp and he had seen a girl that interested him and it was the first time that he felt he wanted to move up from harming animals and he wanted to hurt her. He got her alone and he said that she immediately was smart enough to start working him and complimenting him saying that he was so good looking and she would probably go out with him and that he didn't need to do this. He planned on essaying her. You know what I mean? I can't say the word on YouTube. He planned on essaying her and then killing her. He said that she knew he was planning on ending her somehow, but she was somehow able to get under his skin. And when he was done doing what he did to her, he let her go. He said that for almost two years after this, he beat himself up for letting her go and vowed to himself that he would never let anyone go again. He then said that in 2001, he began his killing spree. Israel was evil, but also extremely smart, choosing his victims at random and said that they were all victims of opportunity and that he enjoyed hunting them like how he had hunted the animals when he was younger. He would target random people from all over the country with no plan in place. This guy was so good at avoiding detection, he would pick places over by campsites and other places and bury what he referred to as kill kits. He later confessed to authorities that these kits were Home Depot buckets that he had filled with guns, ammo, rope, duct tape, shovels, cash, Drano, and lye, which he would use to accelerate human decomposition. He would also fly to these places and rent a car and pay it with everything in cash. While he had removed the battery of his phone, avoiding detections and making him practically untraceable. Israel's first confirmed kills was a Vermont couple named Bill and Lorraine Courier. Bill was 49 and Lorraine was 55. Their bodies have never been found even until this day. Israel said that he broke into their home in June 2011, abducting them and drove them to an abandoned farmhouse. At this point, Bill had started to put up a strong fight and fearing being overpowered, Israel shot him and then he essayed Lorraine, ultimately strangling her when he was done. It is believed by the FBI that Israel was able to get into the couple's home using weapons and tools he had stashed away in one of these kits. Israel told the FBI that he disposed of the weapon at the Blakes River Reservoir and the FBI were able to recover the weapon. Israel sat there for hours talking and talking. I cannot imagine being the people that had to sit there and hear all of this. He continued to speak about all of the lives that he had ended, but through all of it, he had one massive rule, no kids and no dogs. Kids would complicate things too much and dogs were loud. He said that he had abducted and disposed of women in upstate New York, Vermont, and had even killed four in Washington state, but didn't know the names of his victims. So how did this diabolical and intelligent man get caught? In 2012, he broke one of his own rules and he chose a victim that lived close to him and he was so comfortable at this point that he got sloppy. 
On February 1st, 2012, Samantha Koenig was just finishing up her shift at a local drive through coffee stand in Anchorage, Alaska, named The Common Grounds. She was approached by a man wearing a ski mask. That was a little odd, but in Alaska, the temperatures changed a lot, so it wasn't that crazy to see this. The man then ordered a coffee. This man was Israel Keys. There is actually security footage of this, and it shows that as soon as Samantha handed him the cup, Israel pulled a gun on her, and he demanded all of the money, and she handed over everything to him. He then forced himself into the stand. Once he was in, he pulled out zip ties and forced her outside and put her in his white Ford Focus. She tried to escape, but he caught her and threatened if she tried to do it again, he would end her. He was telling her that she just needed to stay calm because he just wanted her for a ransom. Samantha told Israel that her boyfriend was supposed to pick her up from that coffee shop and that her phone was still there and he would start looking for her. So he took her to his house and got Samantha into his shed, which was right outside the front of his house. And he tied her up and went back to the coffee shop retrieving her phone. He then began sending fake text messages to her boyfriend. The text read, hey, I'm spending a couple days with friends. Let my dad know. When Israel got back to the property, he began to have his way with her. He turned his radio up so no one could hear her screams and her pleas for help. When he was done, he demanded her address because he wanted her ATM card. Once he got the information, he left her again and made his way to get her card from her boyfriend's truck. In a gut-wrenching twist, when he was stealing the card, Israel was confronted by Samantha's boyfriend, who had just discovered Samantha was not at work when he arrived to pick her up, as well as receiving a strange text message from her phone earlier. So he was already on edge. Thinking this was a random burglar attempting to break into his car, Samantha's boyfriend ran inside to get help while Israel fled. This must haunt this poor man. When Israel got back to his house, he poured himself a glass of wine and went back to violating this poor girl. He then strangled Samantha to death. Yes, everything in the story is horrific, but this part really gets to me. When he was done doing what he did to Samantha, he left her out there and went inside to pack for a cruise he was about to take with his daughter and his girlfriend. The family left and Samantha's body stayed in the shed the entire time they were gone. And after a great trip, the family returned. Israel decided to write a ransom note, but how would he prove she was still alive to get the ransom? Well, he decided to put makeup on her frozen body, then sew her eyes open with fishing wire, and then took a Polaroid of her holding, you know, had her hands up like this, that day's newspaper. Israel then typed a note demanding $30,000, and he left this and the photograph of Samantha in the park before using Samantha's phone to text her boyfriend. He then drove to a lake, dismembered her body, cut a hole in the ice, and dumped her remains in the lake and went fishing with the small parts. Detectives later asked him if he caught anything, and he replied, of course, like it was nothing. While he was doing this, Someone in the park found the picture and the ransom note, and they alerted the police. Samantha's father, believing his daughter was still alive after seeing the picture, deposited the ransom money into Israel's account. Police were able to track his car from the surveillance video when he went and got the money out. They began tracking him, and when he went three miles 
over the speed limit, they immediately pulled him over and found dye stained bills from a bank robbery, a ski mask, a gun, and Samantha's phone and debit card. He was immediately arrested on March 13, 2012. After his arrest, the interviews began. It was apparent that his motive was sheer pleasure and he was constantly striving to be more effective in his hunting techniques. He took great pleasure in reliving them and told them, I'll tell you everything you want to know. I'll give you blow by blow if you want. I would hunt anything that had a heartbeat. I have lots more stories to tell. And that he did. The biggest thing that sets Israel Keys apart from other serial killers is that he had no victim profile. He would go after men, women, old, young, nothing was a hindrance. He also had a thing for couples, was somehow able to do his dirty deeds to them and leave no trace of DNA behind. He would then immediately put thousands of miles between himself and the crime scene. The authorities believe that he has many other stashes that are hidden around the country, and they believe that they could provide evidence to other unsolved murders. On December 2nd, 2012, Israel Keyes decided to keep the rest of his secrets to himself, and he managed to conceal a razor blade in his cell, which he used to take his own life. But his death was not the end to his story. In 2020, the Alaskan authorities released a drawing of 11 skulls and one pentagram, which they claimed was drawn by Israel as part of his unaliving note. According to the FBI, this is the most tactic acknowledgement by Israel Keys of the 11 lives he took without remorse. That is the horrific true story of Israel Keys one of the most prolific serial killers and essayers of the 21st century. Behind this seemingly normal, successful man laid a heart of pure darkness. Authorities still believe that Keyes lowballed his grisly exploits and that he took out more lives as he crisscrossed the country. What do you think about this case? Had you heard of it before? please let me know in the comment section down below. Please do not forget to like, comment, and subscribe. As always, thank you for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful day, and I will see you next time.